Okay, so let's try to carry out that integration first. Here. That's the integration. And we are going to, uh, we have used a similar technique before in another context. This is the Q space is the dummy integration space. And this was, is an external quantity which is associated with the three variables in the left hand side. Okay, so my, the minus. Okay, so I, first of all, let me plot the picture, then I will integrate. Here is, as I said, this is a fixed given to us. Q is the dummy integration variable. So here is the dummy integration space, Q1, Q2, and Q3. I choose the third axis in the Q space to be parallel to the Y. So here Y defines for me the direction. So this is the Q vector. This is the polar angle. Let's put the subindex theta Q, not to get confused ourselves. So here is the phi Q. So then I is d q q squared zero to infinity and the d omega so d phi q d theta q sine theta d cos theta q is a better notation and if we define the cos theta as the variable so integral is from minus one to plus one and each of the here, each of the i q y cosine theta minus q squared k squared minus plus. Minus plus i epsilon. So obviously phi integration can be carried out immediately. So i plus minus is 2 pi coming from that phi integration because the, the range of phi is 0 to 2 pi. And dq integral 0 to infinity q squared divided by q squared minus k squared minus plus i epsilon prime is the dq integral part. And I have then minus 1 to plus dxc e to the i q y xc. I called the cosine theta the xc. So this integral then is one over i q y e to the i q y minus e to the minus i q y. Right, it's a simple thing because you are lump it in it. For as far as this integral is concerned, the constant, e to the alpha times x c, one over alpha, e to the plus alpha minus alpha. So this kills one of them. So I have two pi over i integral i y, sorry, e 2 pi over i y, d q, 0 to infinity, q, e to the i q y, minus e to the minus i q y, divided by q squared, k squared, minus plus i epsilon prime, is the result. Well, a, a complicated integral enough, and the way it is written uh, doesn't enable us immediately to go to the complex integration. 
We have to carry out a manipulation before going to the complex integration, obviously. What do I mean? It's on the half line because it's spherical polar coordinates in the Q space. Q is the half line. Therefore, in order to be able to go to the complex integration technique, we have to go to the full line, from the half line to the full line first. How do I do that? Well, although it's not that difficult, still let me explain a little bit. And I will do that in the left-hand side, plus minus. Okay. VQ, Q e to the Q, Q1, divided by Q squared minus K squared minus plus. I epsilon is the first integral. The second integral is at a minus sign again from zero to infinity. VQ, Q, e to the minus I Q1, divided by Q squared, K squared prime, epsilon prime. If I drop the prime, forget it, because it's epsilon or epsilon prime, doesn't matter. It is that intermediate expression which is going to be set to zero at the end of the day. So this is the second integral. I split them into two. Here, let me do the following. Define Q equals, say, minus R. I change a variable. I call minus Q as the R. So dq is minus dr. So look at the, the minus sign apart. So what do I have? 0 to minus infinity minus d, dr minus r e to the plus i q r, uh, sorry, i r y, divided by r squared minus k squared minus plus i epsilon. So it is a change of variable. What I see Q, I replace it with the minus R. Minus and minus is plus. But there is an overall minus sign in here, right? Here. So if I change this, then that minus is gone. Minus infinity to zero, dr r e to the r r y r squared minus k squared minus plus i epsilon prime. Now go back to the same name. r equals q. Change name. It's a dummy integration variable. I am free to change it any way I like. Then what becomes? The integral and everything becomes the same, exactly the same with the correct plus sign in the front now. But it's minus infinity to zero. The original one is zero to infinity. Uh, Infinity here, this is minus infinity to zero, the same integral, the same integrand. Therefore, it becomes minus infinity to plus infinity dq, q e to the i q y divided by q squared minus k squared minus plus. That's nice, isn't it? Why? Because now I can indeed go to the complex integration techniques to carry out this integration, because it is in the full real line now, minus infinity to plus infinity. So let's do that. I will use the Cauchy integration integral theorem now. What is the basic philosophy of the Cauchy integration theorem? You have the real line, obviously, that you start with. You go to the complex plane. Here is the complex Q plane. This is the imaginary part of the Q. This is the real part of the Q. You have an integral. An integral, integral. Let me denote this as Currently fq, an integral defined as dq minus infinity to plus infinity of fq 
And you say you go to a contour, closed contour integration, replace this with the uh, closed contour integration. Now here is the complex Q now. This was on the real axis. You remember it. From x to z you go, z is x plus i, y, real and imaginary parts. And so uh, you have to define a closed contour. For instance, in the following manner, take a large R, capital R. Eventually you would let R go to infinity so that indeed the real axis part overlaps with the original integral that you are trying to determine. And then, so this becomes minus r to plus r, the real part, limit r goes to infinity, plus a contour part, which denote as such, for instance, for, for here, although it, this notation is sort of not a universal one, you have the contour part in the complex plane and this then complex integration is equal to the real part which overlaps with your original plus an additional complex part which we denote by the gamma, capital gamma or and the direction is also indicated. You go from minus r to r in the positive direction and you turn over in the complex plane and this is the closed contour. So if it has a pole somewhere, if there is a pole of F inside C denoted as Q0, then this integral, complex integral, is 2 pi i times residue of residue of f q at q equals q zero, right? That's the Cauchy integral theorem. If and only if this additional piece vanishes. If it doesn't vanish, this has no predictive power, obviously. If due to a smart choice that part vanishes, then your result of the integral over the real axis becomes the Cauchy integral theorem's result. So this becomes your result indeed. A beautiful, a very powerful theorem. Okay. I don't know whether you have seen this mathematics as mathematical object before. It is so beautiful and powerful, and in the math in physics, it is in it's a relative of the Gauss's theorem. Why Gauss's theorem was so powerful? You carry out an integral over a surface, and you detect a charge at the center. However large the sphere is, the sphere may be as large as the universe itself, and you could be so far away from that particular charge or whatever sitting in there. And by doing some manipulations on the surface of a large sphere or circle in here, you are detecting something inside, beautiful. You know, that has led, opened up the way towards a new mathematics, right? Algebraic geometry. In itself, so beautiful a mathematics, I don't know whether any of you have seen it before. But this theorem is powerful. You have to really get, you, and you have to admire it and get used to it. It is not something you have to hate. What? Again, the complex integration? Yes. Again, <laughs> Again the complex integration. Okay, so uh, obviously uh, the choice of the contour is uh, crucial in here because uh, you may choose one contour so that the second piece doesn't vanish and you choose another contour that that second piece vanishes. So the first uh, challenge in this game is the choice of the contour. Let's see for our problem what is the contour, whether it should be up or down. The, the, the crucial expression in this integrand, capital F, curly F, is this exponential. Exponentials grow rather fast, right? Particularly as there is an i in it, if the, let's go to the Q notation because R, okay, Q notation. If Q is 
in the imaginary part, then it is i times the imaginary. So i times i is minus. So minus y times the imaginary part of q. If the imaginary part of q is very large, it becomes e to the minus infinity times y, which is zero. So the contour must be up plus i imaginary. If it is minus i imaginary, minus i times i is plus, it, it blows up. If I close the contour down, it blows up. It must be up so that the i should have e to the minus infinity. Okay, so this choice is right. I knew the result beforehand, therefore I have chosen it that way. So this contribution goes to zero. So our expression then is integral integral plus minus dq minus infinity then plus infinity q e to the i q y q squared minus k squared minus plus i epsilon prime is 2 pi i residue of f at the poles. This is a symbolic expression. I say at the poles. But how are the poles? Now, I have to decide on the poles. First of all, why I, I'm trying to keep the discussion so general? Because notice that the, the, the nature of the poles will be decided by the plus and minus. So I have to choose, say, plus epsilon for pi epsilon first, discuss it first of all, which will be, if it is the plus, I will, if this is going to give me the i minus, then I have to choose minus i epsilon which is going to give me the result for the i plus. Okay, so let's move in. Although it may sound a bit pedantic, some people may try to, uh, may attempt to do, carry them out in a single shot. I am not going to do that because it, that may be confusing. So I will do it in two steps. So I'm first doing i minus. i minus means I'm taking the plus sign. So what are the poles? Poles are q squared minus k squared plus i epsilon times zero. So q squared is k squared minus i epsilon prime. Q is plus minus k squared minus i epsilon prime. Well, epsilon is a small thing, so let's expand. What do I mean? This is k squared, 1 minus i epsilon prime k squared. So this is k, 1 half. So 1 minus i epsilon prime k squared. So what are the poles now? Remember, I'm doing this. Never forget that. So first of all, k times 1 minus i epsilon, double prime. Epsilon prime divided again by another positive thing. So it's an a third epsilon, which is to go to 0. Or k minus i k epsilon. That's the first root. The second root is minus k, 1 minus i epsilon double prime, which is minus k plus i epsilon. As a matter of fact, I will write it i triple prime. You see there are how many primes I have. There are so many epsilons in line and line and line go all the way. It's, it's a small thing. So these are the poles that I have for the i minus, mind you. Okay, let me plot the picture and let me write the result down. Here is the poles. Here is my 
large enough iTunes so that poles fall inside the contour, right? The first pole, this is the I minus case. Uh, here is the capital minus R, capital plus R. One is K minus outside. The other is minus K plus. So this is the pole which falls inside, inside. Nice, isn't it? So this analysis of the pole is obviously an important issue because only the poles inside the contour gives a contribution, right? What is the then I minus is 2 pi I residue of F Q at Q equals minus K. Well, if you want, plus I epsilon, put it there. Because I'm going to set epsilon goes to zero at the end of the day, so it's going to disappear. So let's do that. How is the pole structure of the F Q? How do I write that? Obviously, I can write it, but let's call one of them is the plus, the other is the minus. So let me give a name. This is Q plus, this is Q minus, yeah, to factor it. So FQ can be factored as Q times A to the IYQ divided by Q minus Q plus Q minus Q minus. That is the form of the poles in the denominator. Which one is in? Minus is in. So I rewrite this. I'm sorry for some of you who know this quite well that I shouldn't do such an elementary discussion. I apologize for that. So Q minus Q plus divided by Q minus Q minus. Reason I have written this is I made this particular pole inside the contour made manifest. Okay, capital F is the little f divided by Q minus the relevant pole. So residue, that residue of FQ at Q equals, let's give this the shorthand name Q minus, is going to be then residue of FQ at Q equals Q minus is the value of this at Q equals Q minus. That is Q minus times e to the i, oh, it's not minus, Q minus times e to the i Q, Q minus divided by Q minus minus Q plus. Okay, that's uh, the expression. So let me write that result down, finished. So what was the Q minus when uh, epsilon goes to zero? It is minus K, minus K times E to the my I Q minus K, divided by minus K minus Q plus, which is minus K, Minus 2k minus k is 1 over 2. How nice. Unexpectedly beautiful and simple result, isn't it? So my integral then is 2 pi i times 1 half e to the minus i y k, which is i pi e to the minus i y k. This is my i minus. Okay, I minus is this expression. Now next I have to compute the I plus. Let me see whether I can do it on that picture. Well, perhaps I shouldn't, as it is being taken to the movie, then I have to do it cleanly somewhere. Otherwise I would have done it on the same, changing the signs and everything. So I'll do it cleanly. So let me copy, first of all, my result. I minus is 2 pi, no, I pi times e to the minus yk. Okay. 
Remember y is x minus x prime, so it's the magnitude of x minus x prime if you want. But I will go back to that notation later. Now let's do the i plus. i plus corresponds to the minus i epsilon prescription. So what are the poles now? q squared minus k squared minus i epsilon is equal to zero, right? That's the denominator. So q is plus minus k squared plus i epsilon to the one half. Use the binomial expression, expansion because this is a small thing, plus minus k. 1 plus i epsilon divided by 2k squared is the expansion. Let's call it again. So, two roots, k plus i epsilon triple prime minus k times minus i epsilon. I'm using all epsilon instead of using fourth or fifth indices. So these are the poles now for this new case, however. So let's give this a name, q plus Q minus, and the label plus and minus is decided by the present the sign of the i epsilon. So let me plot the picture to see where those poles are. So that's large enough R. That's the closed contour, closed up again. We have this K plus minus K minus. So minus K minus is out. It is the Q plus pole which is inside. So let me write the curly F accordingly. Curly F using that uh, structure F of Q, Q e to the i, Q y, Q minus, Q minus divided by Q, Q plus. Because I write this square as Q minus, Q plus, Q minus, Q minus and put the irrelevant part up in the residue function and put the relevant one down, which is this one is the relevant. So I see it's obvious. So what is the residue of fq at q equals q plus is q plus e to the i q plus y divided by q plus minus q minus. That's the residue. I have, I have just set that Q plus. What is Q plus when epsilon goes to zero? Q plus is K. So this is K times I K Y K minus minus K. So it is two, so one half E to the I K Y. So it is the exponential part which changes sign. So what is the i plus then? It is 2 pi i times the integral which is 1 half e to the i k y or pi i e to the i k y. Now I can combine the two results and write a single result. This was very safe and clean to do, to do it separately. Some of you may be too smart that you can do it in a single shot, obviously, but I suggest that please play the safe. It costs an ad additional five minutes only, not more than that. So, i plus minus is i pi times e to the, indeed, sign came out to be correct, ky. The plus came with the plus sign, minus came with the minus sign. And now if I go back to the expression G, G had the 2m over h bar squared right, this is the one. Okay, so uh, I, let me write this now down, i pi 
e to the plus minus i k y i's cancel and so there is a uh, two pi squared so minus two pi to the minus three plus two pi squared e to the plus minus i k y divided by y so this is what this is minus 1 over 4 pi, correct? Yes, e to the minus plus i, k, y, and y is the g plus minus that we have. Okay. Yes, beautiful. This is indeed the result. So we can go back to the equation of G is determined as promised beautifully. So we can go back to our equation, lipman schwinger equation. Yes, I can erase here. So we have minus 2m over h bar squared, indeed. So what is the lipman schwinger equation? Psi plus minus x, x, phi, that free part I write it in this fashion on purpose, 2m over h bar squared, minus, because there's also minus sign, 1 over 4 pi, b cube x prime. Remember y was, let's remember the definition of y. So there is this minus 1 over 4 pi, indeed so, okay. d cube x prime, I have written that, e to the plus minus i k x minus x prime divided by x minus x prime times v of x prime times psi plus and minus of x prime. So that is the form of the integral equation, uh, which is quite nice. Of course, B is to be specified at the end of the day, but that's dynamics, and this part is just uh, kinematics that we have been quite successful in constructing. So in the remaining time, let me decide on the sign. All this plus and minus is due to the fact that we have uh, to regularize the singularity in the 1 over e minus h3 operator. We have added a mathematical piece, plus minus i epsilon, and these signs correspond to that, and they reflected itself. They reflected themselves in the form. So we have to really decide between the two expressions. In here, to decide what is the correct mathematical prescription of i epsilon. How to proceed? To proceed, we have to now go to a physical uh, setting. That is, in physical situation is, x is large, we detect far away, and x prime is small, because x prime is the potential region. It sweeps the region in which the, the effect of the potential is focused. So when you have this uh, two conditions, we have to be able to make use of it. That is, if I convert this, this to mathematics, x prime divided by x is small very small in actual physical situation. That is, if you take that ratio to be very small as compared to one, how, in what sense it's going to help me 
to clarify, to decide on the sign. For that, let me look at that difference. That, that portion is important. What is x minus x prime? It is square root of x minus x prime squared, right? That's the meaning of this mod square of a vector, the square root of the square. So let's expand this inside and make use of this expression. x squared plus x prime squared, well actually let me go in the order, twice x times x prime plus x prime squared. If I take the x out, that is writing is x more squared than out, so it is 1 minus twice x x prime divided by x squared plus x x squared x prime squared divided by x squared one half. That, that's the expression, right? In a sense. We factored the large part out and we, we form that ratio. What is this? It is the ratio, if I denote this as epsilon, just as a shorthand, small number. You see this intermediate term is order epsilon because one of the x's cancel and there is x prime over x, the other one. The other is in the unit direction. So this is first order, that's the second order. What is the approximation? We have to do the approximation two steps. First of all, you drop the second order and write it as the first order expression, one minus O, it's dropping the second. And then using the binomial, one minus twice x dot x prime divided by x squared times one half, because it is one minus epsilon over two. So x, x prime divided by x squared. So that is the approximation. Or better written as x minus x dotted x prime divided by x mod Correct? Because one of the x mod squared cancel against the overall factor and there's an x mod left, x dotted in the x prime. So what is this really? If you, th this is the unit factor in the x direction. Okay. So this is the approximate expression for the x minus x prime mod. We will use this both in the exponential and in the denominator, but the exponential one is crucial. It's going to help us in choosing the sign. Let me show how, does it, how it happens. Let me consider the exponential. e to the plus minus i k x minus x prime, right? That's the exponential in here. So if I write this as e to the plus minus i k times, what is inside? Inside is here, x minus x unit times x prime. That is this difference, right? So, e to the plus minus i k x is the first factor, and second factor is what? The second factor is e to the minus plus now. Pay attention to this. I was coming plus minus due to the minus sign in here, minus plus so if I say minus sign in here, I refer to the plus i epsilon. If I refer to the plus sign, I refer to minus i epsilon to keep track of it. So k times x times x prime.
what is this k times x? x is the, uh, we have erased this, let me, this physical picture is important. Here is the configuration. We come, come close to the potential and we deviate and we go to the detector. This is the x, right? As measured from here. And x prime is this, in this region. Local target region. X is the measurement of the final, st final particle at the detector. So what is this? K prime. Why do I say so? It's elastic. Initial momentum and final momentum are the same. This momentum is the unit vector, which is x in the direction times the magnitude. Magnitudes are the same, so this is k prime. Good. What about here? This is constant. It is r. It comes out of the integral, right? So let, let me focus on the integral term. Let me focus on integral term. Instead of writing everything. Well, perhaps you can even say that. Psi plus minus minus phi of x. Let's use the symbolic free particle solution as such. Minus 2m over h bar squared, 1 over 4 pi times. This is independent of the x prime integration. I take it out. Plus minus i k r d cube x prime e to the minus plus I forgot the i in here. Sorry. Please correct this. Otherwise it's going to be irrelevant. x prime divided by still let me keep it as x minus x prime times v of x prime, times psi plus minus x prime. I will move a little bit to the left so that it can be seen. This is the integral term. Forget the, what is inside the integral. There is plenty of things that we have to carry out if once the v is known. But this term is important. What does this term tell you? This is a time-independent formalism, that's stationary state. What is the time associated with this if I convert it into time-dependent solution? e to the minus i over h bar et is the time factor which I have to multiply my wave function, right? Psi plus minus x. So it is this exponential comes next to it because everything else is integrated. Here only 1 over r will come out, but that doesn't change my argument for this argument. So it is plus minus i, plus minus is correct in here, yes, but here minus plus, it's, it's reversed, i k r. So that will be the two possible forms of the outgoing solution. This under the integral is the outgoing solution. What is the first one? There are two possible forms of the solution. One solution is e to the i k r minus, right, e over h bar is omega frequency, omega t. The other is e to the minus sign i k r plus omega t. So the, these are the two forms of the outgoing solutions in time. In order to describe the propagation in time, I had to put in this time factor. It was a time independent stationary state solution. Standard time factor is this one. What is the difference between the first one and the second one? I claim that this is forward moving. The second one is backward moving. Let's analyze that. So the difference between the first and second. 
The first, which is related to the plus sign, uh, plus i epsilon, is so plus i epsilon gives you <laughs> minus omega. Remember, I define e over h bar as the omega, as uh, is the usual. Does it really move forwardly? That is, if I change t to t plus delta t, is it delta r, delta r, does it change, increase in the positive or negative direction? If it also changes in the positive direction, if it increases, that's forward moving, correct? So, if t goes to t plus delta t, in order to keep the phase constant phase, you know, that's the optics you remember from your optics classes. To have the constant phases, so you have what? K R plus delta R minus omega T plus delta T should be equal to K R minus omega T. So what do I get from here? K delta R minus omega delta T is equal to zero. Delta R is omega over K delta T indeed plus. If delta t, if I let time evolve, delta r, inc r increases by delta r amount. This is indeed forward moving, outgoing. And although we know the other must be the incoming, that is when we are approaching to the target, it starts generated at the infinity comes close. When we reach the target, it comes and reaches us. Funny, right? That's the backward movement. Let's demonstrate that minus i epsilon, which led us to, to that form, minus i kr plus omega t. Again, look at the constant phases. Then what you get? k delta r plus omega delta t is equal to zero, delta r is minus omega over k delta t. As t evolves, increases, r decreases. That's backward. Moving or incoming, obviously, that's not physical because somehow there is a Maxwell's demon type of stuff when we approach the target, something starts at the infinity, at the asymptotia, comes and reaches us at the time we reach to the target. So it's not physical, we have to throw it. So what is then? The correct sign is the plus opt i epsilon because it leads to the correct asymptotic behavior. That's a good point to stop. So we have the plus sign. We decided on plus i epsilon prescription. You see how nice to put the physics and mathematics together. The two really complement each other beautifully. So we are going to proceed. We have now a nice formalism and we are going to go to the Born approximation and higher Born approximations later. So it's okay for today.